Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, we are seeing the president for the first time since last week's Capitol siege as the House prepares for an unprecedented second impeachment inquiry. The president left the White House moments ago, headed for the U.S.-Mexico border. He's visiting the wall he prioritized building throughout his administration. It's worth noting President Trump has not made any public statements since his Twitter account was permanently suspended Friday night. But President Trump did finally speak with Vice President Mike Pence yesterday in their first meeting since last week's siege. We'll have more on that conversation in a moment. We're also seeing new disturbing images from the Capitol last week, including a video of rioters throwing a fire extinguisher at Capitol Police. Security is ramping up in D.C. as we learn about new threats against Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, with just eight days to go until the inauguration. And as he heads to the U.S.-Mexico border, President Trump is speaking publicly after days of silence. White House correspondent Kira Phillips joins me now for more on that. Kira, what did the president have to say, and why take this trip now? Right. Well, first of all, let's get to what he said. We've decided not to even air it because what he said was just simply, I think, delusional is the best way to put it. And that's, of course, what critics are saying now as soon as they heard his words, because he actually said to reporters, they, we don't even know who they are, looked at my speech, looked at my words, and I have no regrets, and I said nothing that was inappropriate. I, I think we just need to, to move on, because that, that, that is just simply not true when you look at what happened last week. And it's just completely disrespectful to those who died and the violence that took place up on Capitol, Capitol Hill. So let's move on to why he's making this trip. Look, I mean, he's trying to save his legacy, right? He's heading to Alamo, Texas, not to be confused with the Alamo, by the way. And, you know, he's speaking speaking to his base. I mean, the core issue during his, his campaigning and when he did step into office was that he was going to build a, quote, big, beautiful wall, and he was going to keep the Mexicans out. And you remember all the controversy surrounding the, the comments that, that he made about immigrants. But he's speaking to his base. He's trying to galvanize his supporters. He's trying to go somewhere where he thinks, OK, they'll pay attention to me. This is a big part of my legacy. This was one of my big promises to the country. But I have to tell you, Diane, I think it's being completely overshadowed by what's happening on the Hill and how Democrats are going forward with yet another impeachment. And at least three House Democrats have now tested positive for COVID-19 since the siege last week, saying some of the lawmakers they were in lockdown with refused to wear masks. Now at least one congresswoman is calling for fines. What's the latest? That's right. So we just actually, this just came through about five minutes ago, Diane. Democrat from Illinois, uh, Brad Snyder, is the third member to test positive now for COVID. Uh, the first representative that came forward was Bonnie Watson Coleman, the Democrat from New Jersey. And then it was Representative uh, Primla Jayapal, who, who just came forward and, and made a lot of noise about the fact that, that more people are testing positive since that lockdown. And here's what sort of created the conversation. Um, when the, the doctor up on the, the Hill announced that there was somebody that tested positive and there was concern about everybody being jammed in really tight uh, during the siege there on Capitol Hill and, and there were people not wearing masks. Matter of fact, there was a video that surfaced, Diane, you might remember, where a Democrat uh, was seen handing out masks and Republican members were not accepting the masks. I mean, we don't, we still don't know who exactly was uh, in infected at the time and how exactly this spread. But clearly, there is concern about the fact that everybody was hunkered down, and it was a double whammy. Uh, there was a violent mob uh, infiltrating the Capitol. Meanwhile, there was somebody that was positive with COVID and, and possibly passing it along to other members as they were all jammed in face to face. So yes, Jayapal is calling for fines, uh, but we're yet to see what exactly will happen. And President Trump met with Vice President Pence last night for the first time since Pence announced Biden's electoral victory. What do we know about that meeting? 
Can I tell you something, Diane? I would have loved to been a fly on the wall during that meeting. I would I have loved many to have others. <laughs> yes, exactly. And isn't that interesting that that meeting was closed off to reporters? And and really, all we have is what the White House is saying happened within that meeting. And it was it was very vanilla that they talked about the last four years. They talked about the weak left. Um, that those that in that were a part of that violent mob on the hill were not people that represented. Um, Trump's uh, America First movement. But look, we know Donald Trump by now pretty well, right? I can't imagine that the conversation about invoking the 25th Amendment didn't come up in that meeting. And then the conversation uh, just prior, uh, a week before, uh, when when the president was very vocal and putting pressure on, on Vice President Pence to, quote, do what's right uh, about the Electoral College count. So what truly happened in that meeting? Uh, it will be hard to find that out. But what the White House is saying is that it was a civil conversation and they were reflecting on what they've done in the past four years and how they're going to go forward this next week. And we're also learning more about the backlash from private companies over President Trump's role in last week's event. What's the latest there? Well, I mentioned that yesterday. You and I talked a little bit about it, and I'm not surprised. Things started to sort of percolate yesterday um, when the PGA came forward and said, we're pulling the championship uh, tournament uh, from uh, Trump's uh, golf club in Bedminster. That was a huge move and, and change and, and announcement, because that hits uh, President Trump right in the pocketbook and right to the heart. You know he loves golf, he loves his golf clubs, and this is a big money maker for him. So from the time you and I talked about that to, to today, Deutsche Bank yanking its relationship, Signature Bank yanking its relationship, uh, donations freezing. You know, Trump has a lot of properties. He has a lot of real estate. His brand is already starting to get hit hard, and that's going to continue. So when you're talking about President Donald Trump and his brand and his bank account, and that now that's taking a big hit, well, it's not going to stop, I can tell you that. And I'm sure we'll hear uh, from him regarding uh, how this is going to have such a tremendous economic impact on him. Just put aside the political impact. What's going to happen to his wallet, his future, his investments? Unknown at this point, but it's not looking good. All right. Kira Phillips for us in Washington. Thank you. Bet. And now to a new TikTok trend that could help keep you safe. Users are creating videos to help others in possible danger. Just play the video out loud to anyone around you, and it looks and sounds like you're on the phone with someone. Becky Worley has the story. Hey, girl, you almost here? This is not a real phone call. Okay, cool. What's the matter? You sound like something's wrong. Something it's a TikTok video someone can play when they're traveling alone, don't have someone to talk to immediately, and feel unsure of their surroundings. I don't entirely believe you. I'm going to keep you on the phone until we meet up. With prompts to respond, the video makes it seem like you're having a real conversation. This video by Mendy you. Perdue viewed millions of times. Up. The whole thing started because my friend called me one night when she was leaving work and I was supposed to be there to answer the phone and be her conversation, and I was unavailable. Luckily, nothing happened to Perdue's friend. The incident, though, inspiring her to help others. I decided to make a safety call video. Uh, Purdue posting videos on TikTok with various earbuds? scenarios for kids walking alone hey. to school. Are you on your way to school? Or someone right, potentially being followed in a parking lot. Out. I'll be there in just a few minutes. I should be pulling right up. I started getting all of these amazing messages, just people saying thank you. This has helped me in so many ways. TikTok users like Ivana Gracia, who says one of Purdue's videos stopped someone who was possibly following her. I feel like that video helped me and it can help a lot of other people since um, a lot of people don't feel safe. Purdue inspiring other creators to make their own videos with the hashtag safety call. Hey kiddo, what's up? We started to read through the comments and somebody said, boy, it would be really, really great if somebody would do this, but from a dad. So you're on your way back to your dorm now? Hey, you got your spray with you, right? Good girl. Three out of 10 Americans say they feel unsafe walking alone at night. TikTok safety calls are, are not the magic bullet to keep you safe. They are a great tool, but that's what you should have is multiple tools in your arsenal. To stay safe when you're alone, experts advise always tell someone where you're going. Also, stay aware of your surroundings and turn on your phone's camera.
criminals don't want to be seen on camera committing these crimes. And so having that camera going is a great deterrent. And if you think you're in danger, call 911 immediately. Purdue does that on her videos and tells others to do the same. Put on the bottom a reminder. If you feel you are in danger, call 911. And users are getting increasingly creative with these videos. Some make it sound like the person on the line can actually see you. Another, aimed at getting the user out of a sketchy date, pretends to be your irate mother who wants you home immediately. Our thanks to Becky Worley for that report. And the Alabama Crimson Tide won its sixth national championship in 12 years, beating Ohio State last night in Miami. Heisman Trophy winning wide receiver Devontae Smith made it look easy, shattering records with 12 catches and three touchdowns in just the first half. ESPN college football analyst Jesse Palmer has all the highlights. Pass, Overnight. Championship unlike any before it because the season was so unprecedented. Two undefeated teams ending an unlikely season, with number one Alabama defeating number three Ohio State with a score of 52 to 24. Jones steps up right down the middle of the field. It's touchdown. The star of the night, Heisman Trophy winner Devontae Smith, smashing seven records. Smith with 12 receptions, three touchdowns, and 215 yards, all before halftime, garnering praise from dozens of sports giants online, like LeBron James, the Buckeyes fan, writing, man, is he good. And when Smith left the game with an injured hand in the second half, teammates Najee Harris and Mac Jones helping to finish what he started, smashing records of their own. And what an incredible story of perseverance and development in Mac Jones. The win, an historic milestone for coach Nick Saban earning him a seventh championship trophy and moving him past Paul Bear Bryant for the most titles in college football history. They say big time players make big plays in big games and Devontae Smith certainly did that. It's been a season unlike any other and in the end, the Crimson Tide are national champs. It's their sixth national championship in the last 12 years. Diane? Not bad. Jesse Palmer, Miami for us. Thanks, Jesse. And that does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news context and analysis. I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern with Terry Moran for The Breakdown. It was an historic day on Capitol Hill. After hours of unusually emotional debate, both houses voted to give President Bush the authority to use American military might to force Saddam Hussein to withdraw Iraqi troops from Kuwait. The vote in the Senate was a relatively close 52 to 47, but the margin in the House of Representatives was 250 to 183. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.